Thank you, Iris. I'll leave that up yeah. to you. You'd make yeah. those decisions. <laughs> So hi everyone, good evening. Um, for those who don't know me, um, even though I, I know many of you, my name is Larissa Wall and I'm the Assistant Director of Community Engagement here at BJ. Um, currently in California, so it might look a little lighter out where I am than when you, where you are, but it seems like our weather uh, is beautiful, which is great. Um, I know the East Coast has had some up and down weather, so I hope that it's smooth sailing for you all. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight um, helping facilitate Miriam's program. Um, I think it's going to be a really re enriching evening. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, please keep yourselves muted so that we don't have a lot of background noise. Um, and if you have questions, Miriam's going to try to, we're going to try to keep them to the end. So if you do have questions and you want to put them in the chat box so that you remember them or so that you can uh, let us know about them, feel free to do that. Um, if not, we can wait till the end um, and you'll be able to ask your questions. Um, and we'll also be doing a, um, sending everyone into breakout rooms um, at the very end to be writing some, some of your own um, promises. Um, and Miriam will be sharing a little bit more about how that's gonna work when she's done. Miriam, did I miss anything? No, that's good, thank okay, you. Okay, great, so I am going to pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa, and Shuli for, first of all, organizing this entire series virtually so we could all learn and be together. And Larissa for being with us tonight to help facilitate all these things. And again, I'm just delighted to see everyone from coast to coast. Um, I ask you to, if you can, if you're sitting at your desk, to have a piece of paper and a pen or pencil so that we can, if time permits, at the end we'll do an experiential where I will give you um, the intention, the kavana, and uh, just fill in one or two words. It will be very simple and we'll do a, a breakout room little situation. So um, let's begin. So what we'll learn is that um, for each Chag, Pesach, for the Shalosh Regalim, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, Shabbat, Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, and several other situations in which we are involved, um, there are symbols for all of those. We're going to see a lot of them tonight, but not everything from this wonderful book by Marc Alain Wachnin, was a was at the time a young rabbi and Kabbalist in Paris uh, that I had a chance to study with, and this is the cover of his book from which we will be gleaning a lot of things tonight. It was called the Symbol du Judaïsme, and uh, there are these uh, extraordinary photographs which you will see by um, Laziz Hamani. You can go to the next page, Larissa, of the book. Um, but we'll, we will send it to you at the end so you have the particulars of that book. So, um, so let, let's see. So we could put up the Yud. That's from the uh, second batch. So, what our tradition asks of us is to begin with humility and humbleness. Those are two factors which run throughout our tradition. And one of the ways that we learn about this is that the Yud, which is the smallest of all the letters, is the letter that begins each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Every single letter begins with Yud. We can go to the Aleph, the third one. So if you see, I mean, to me, this is such an aesthetic, well-balanced image. Clean, thoughtful, and silent. So we begin with the smallest, and we begin with silence. Silence has a place. And we will see how we nourish and how we, we are nourished 
by these symbols every day. Of course, there are the given times, and the given times are repeated yearly, such as the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, monthly, the uh, Rosh Chodesh, weekly, Shabbat, daily, Kashrut, and the including the mortars Kaddish for, for some. So this smallest letter, as you see there from the Aleph, is what begins the letters. And we look at them every day when we use either the Siddur or look at any other kind of uh, scripture or look at the Torah. And then, so the Aleph was a little bit upset. And the Aleph said, came to Hashem and said, I don't understand why I don't begin the first word, the most important word in the Torah, Bereshit. You gave that to the Bet. And Hashem said, okay, I will find a place for you and you will be at the beginning of our alphabet. So there's the Aleph, which is silent, and which will take us through this journey. So I just want to show you in our shul, you can, I'll move out of the way. You can see, can everybody see that? Now, when you, when you face the bima, it's on the left. So now, when you look at that, you'll be reminded. And that's what symbols are. Let me go back to... Less busy. So let's go now to another image, which is the mezuzah, that's uh, 110. Marissa. Marissa, are you there? I'm here, it should be up on the screen. The mezuzah? I don't see it. It's, uh, it should be up for everyone else. Folks, okay. you can let me know in the chat if it's not showing up for you. So yeah. is it? The, I see it. You see the mezuzah. Okay, that's one, t that's number 10. So what Nin says, the mezuzah plays a symbolic role as a reminder to follow a certain ethics of remaining on the way. And as you know, the mezuzah is, when it's fixed on the wall, it's slanted. And he says the reason that it's slanted is because a Jew is always in motion. And the mezuzah, um, let's take a look at uh, number 13, which is what is inside. Do everybody see that? So inside is the Shema that's also written by hand in the parchment. And the mezuzah that's fixed at the door is not just a sign that there's a Jew living there, but this, the mezuzah is a reminder for us as we enter and as we leave that there's a certain behavior, the behavior of us inside the home and the behavior that we have outside the home. And the mystical tradition says there are three ways that we live our lives. One is how you tie your shoes. 
The second is how you boil an egg. And the third is how you cross the street. So what is meant by that? So the way you tie your shoelaces is the first thing you do in the morning is you get up. How are you treating yourself? How do you regard yourself? Tying your shoelaces is the act of bending, bending over. We bend over to listen to a small voice. We bend over to listen to a child. We bend over to listen to someone who's ill. We bend over at different times at different occasions. So tying your shoelace is how we regard ourselves from the beginning of the day. How are we going to be treating ourselves? The second is how you boil an egg. Well, there's not many ways to boil an egg, but to boil an egg. But what the deeper meaning is, what will you be nourishing yourself with? What are you giving yourself? How, what is your intake? How are you treating your body? How are you treating your mind and your soul and your neshama? And then how you cross the street. How are you in public? When you cross the street, do you look and see if somebody needs help to cross the street? Are you aware of yourself as you cross the street, as you are in the world with others? and as you're representing yourself and yourself as a Jew. So the Kabbalah points out these three ways, which I think are ways that we can remember and that we can, that can continue to feed our, um, our, our intention outside the home. Then we go to the tzitzit. So the tzitzit, and we'll just go to that picture of two with you. So the tzitzit are the ways in which we are brought in. We've often seen young boys and some Orthodox folks who you see their tzitzit dangling from their clothes outside, from their talit, the talit uh, katan that they wear underneath. And those tzitzit are there for us, not for the wearer, but for the one who sees, because those tzitzit are the reminders, there are 613 knots. There, I'll just read you a couple of couplings of how it goes. Two knots, 10 wraps for the letter Yud. Two knots, five wraps for the letter He. Two knots, six wraps for the letter Vav. Two knots, five wraps for the letter He, and two knots. Two knots, seven wraps. Two knots, eight wraps. Two knots, 11 wraps. Two knots, 13 wraps. Two knots. That's just the beginning. And there's a parable of a man who comes to Rosh Hashanah time, decides to bring his talit to the cleaners, to have a clean. And he goes to the first shop, and the man says, oh, I can do it for 200 shekels. So he thinks it's a, little, it's a little steep. So he goes to the next guy. He says, well, I could do it for you for 140. And he goes to a few, and they each have different prices in a descending order. And he goes back to the first man, and he says, you know, your competition here is huge. Why is it that you're charging so much for me to have my talit clean? He says, yes, but do they undo the knots? So we're, we're looking at, the, <laughs> we're, 
we're looking at the tzitzit and one of the very first things that when we do the birkot al-shachar in the morning is we hold the tzitz, one tzitz from each side, so we have two in the hand, and we begin the, the birkot al-shachar holding the two tzitzit together as we say the, 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 the different words of, uh, of, that, uh, of the birkat, and that is to represent that we hold the earth and the sky together. So first thing as we get up and we come to services, we hold the tzitzit. It's our first entry into a symbol. We hold the two tzitzit holding the earth and the sky together. Then we go to the Amida. In the Amida, we take three steps back and three steps forward. One of the Midrash about the steps is that it says you can't occupy a place that you already occupy. So in order to come new to that place, you step away and you step in. So we begin again with those two very important factors, humility and humbleness. We're coming before Hashem. We want to be a new person. Well, that's a little difficult to do. So the symbol is to step back three steps and then to step forward three steps. And we are another person. We're not the same person who we were when we first occupied the first when we first stood. So it's as if we are in constant awareness. And then we wear the, the let's look at the second image of the, of the talit, or eight, number eight. I don't see the image. I wonder how I can see the image with you. Is it up now? The one in front of the window? The, the, just, just the whole bunch of uh, tzitzit. The, after, the, the one that's after the... Um... That one was actually just up, so I'll go to the oh, okay. individual one. So... Then we have the talit. The talit itself, so that's uh, four, six, and eight. So that's on in front of the window. So the talit, when Hashem looks down on us, what he sees is all the same. There's no silk, there's no cotton, there's no polyester. It's all the same, and we're all the same. It's as if he knows that we're only children, and that he instills in us a certain chain, a grace. And the, the grace is the way in which we obviously behave, but also how we wear what we wear, and that no one should feel left out that there's a unity and then there's a, fortunately at BJ we have that all the time that nobody looks at how people are dressed or whether they know how to daven or they don't. And Marshall had a wonderful parable that he would tell once in a while of a man who is sitting in the back of the shul and he go, he's just going over the alphabet and he goes, Aleph Beis, Gimel, Dalet, Aleph Beis, Gimel, Dalet. And the man next to him, a little annoyed, goes to the rabbi, says, you know, this guy behind me, I don't know what he's trying to say because he's just bumbling the alphabet. So the rabbi says, okay, let me see. So he goes to him and he's, talks to him for a while, and then he says, I understand that you recite the alphabet, the Lashon HaKodesh, the holy, the holy alphabet. 
And he says, yes, because I don't know how to read Hebrew and I want to say Kaddish. And the rabbi says, don't worry, continue. Hashem will put the letters together. So that sense of inclusion is something that I think we're very fortunate that we have, we, and we have had right from the beginning with the way we treat one another and the way people feel welcome when they come. So, um, let's see. So let's look at um, some of the some of the ways in which the aesthetics are so important because that's what draws us in and that's what we remember. In the book of Shmot, the very first discussion of the building of the Mishkan in Teruma is the first sign that aesthetics is of great importance. And one of them is that there's a repetition of three colors that are harmonious and pleasant to look at. And that is purple, crimson, and turquoise. And it's repeated over and over throughout the building of the Mishkan is purple, crimson, and turquoise. And when you look at those three colors together, there is nothing jarring. There's there's a harmony and there's an aesthetic that's there. And then later on, we learn about Betzalel, who was imbued with this spiritual knowing. And it's interesting that, that he was very young. The, we, the, the Midrash says he was a, a young boy when he was assigned this job of the designing of the, of the Mishkan and that he had the insight to know how to select the kind of wood that was needed, the acacia wood, the different silver, gold, and, and such, and that there was a harmony in the way he proceeded. So aesthetics has a very huge place in our tradition. We don't often have a sense of that, but there's room for these symbols to remind us all the time. So let's take a look at one that we're familiar with, which is the Shabbat candles. So the Shabbat candles way ahead of so many other times and some, so many other ways in which people have respected and made a time holy uh, have been our Shabbos candles that are there to remind us that we're making a separation. And sometimes we light the candles outside of the prescribed time and comes Hillel and Shammai, and there's a, a discussion about lighting of the candles. Shammai says, it's not negotiable. Here is a prescribed time, it's 4.30, it's 7, it's depending on the seasons. There's an appointed time and we should respect to that appointed time. Come Hillel, who says, better a little Shabbos than none. Bring Shabbos into the home, light the candles when you can. And so that we have the kindling of the Shabbos lights, sometimes when you come back from shul, sometimes now we do it all together because we have Zoom, so we don't, we're not punished for bringing in the Shabbos lights because it's having them lit that is the essence. And one of the ways in which we make 
this rule available is a very interesting set of images that we have between the Birkat Ahomets and Tashlich. Let's take a look at that image of the spoon. I'm bringing it up. And the feather is number one. So there are similarities between these two times of Tashlich when we go to the water and empty our pockets. I like to think of emptying, emptying them out of lint as opposed to breadcrumbs so that we don't feed the fish of our sins, but that everybody has dust in there. If you go to the bottom of your pockets, you will notice that you have lint. And the gesture is the same. We get on the floor and we use the feather and that spoon to pick up the chametz that's on the floor. And symbolically, what we're doing in either of those two instances is to make room. Symbolically, we make, we're making room so that whatever is meant for us to have, whatever is behind that veil, can be made available for us. Hashem has something for each of us. What I can do, maybe you can't do, but together we complement each other and I can use what you do and you can use what I do. So we make room, but we can't have that unless room is made. You can't fill a glass that's already full. If you drop a cube of ice into a full glass, it'll flow over. But if you make room by sipping, there's a little bit of space. And it's the same thing with Tashlich and the Chametz. We're making room for what is intended for us to have. It's not easy. It's uh, easier to say we'll make room for something, but to actually do it. But when we look at this feather, and we look at this feather and the spoon, we're immediately reminded of what we need to do with those objects. We're picking up the chametz that's fallen to the floor, but we're also throwing it out. We're getting rid of it. We're emptying out our pockets of the lint. We're getting rid of it. And whatever is meant for us to have individually, that's in what I like to think of it as our little toolbox. We all each get a little toolbox when we're born. And sometimes we have similar tools to the other, and sometimes we'll have a different tool here and there from the other. We're not to envy. Everyone has a lot. Everyone has a role. Everyone has a part to play. And we can only do a tikkun, a real tikkun, when we're at one and in harmony with who we are. Because no one can do what you do. Even the tradition says, shifting a piece of paper from one side to the other. The way you move it with your hand is singular. No one else can do it quite like you. So, now we come to the Sefer Torah. <clears throat> so this is a very beautiful image, I think. Some of these images are stunning. And for those of you who have the book, it's on page 43. Um, when we look at that, it, to, to those of us who know what this object, quote unquote, is, we recognize it immediately. And we receive that because we agreed, we made an agreement with Hashem. He offered the Torah to all the nations and he responded, what, what do you mean I can't do this and I can't do that? I will do what I want. And we're the ones who responded, Na'aseh I will do 
and then I will listen. How, how do we translate that in every day when we look at the Torah? And that is that the words that are contained on those, on those pieces of parchment are the blueprints, is the philosophy that to me Judaism represents. And Waknin says that when we became institutionalized is when we lost ground. When we were a way of life, a way in which we deal with one another, in a way in which we deal with ourselves, in way, ways in which we deal in business, as we read in the last few parshiot about not wronging a store owner, not wronging, even in the slightest way, the Torah says you, you shall not steal, not even a little, not even the size of an olive. It is because it leads to other things. Stealing leads to lying, it might lead to more dangerous things and more unpleasant things. So stealing, in fact, which is one of the commandments, one would think there could be other to take its place, but it leads to other things. And that's within the pages of our, of our, of our Torah. Another, another way to achieve what is called the pardes, the paradise, is the, the four letters, pe, resh, galet, so, so. And the pardes, in order to reach paradise, conveniently the word reminds us of the word paradise, is how we read the Torah. There's the pshat level, which is the simple. Pshat is, it, some of you who speak Yiddish, is post and push it. It's the first level. It's the first level of the reading. The second level is the remez, is the hint. What is the Torah trying to tell us? What, it, what is the hint in that phrase or in, in why the letters are transposed, meaning other words when the letters are transposed? Then we go to the drash, and the drash is our interpretation of what we're reading. We have comments, we have commentary ourselves. We read someone does this and then this happens, or you waited by the fountain and she came and gave water to the animals, and what does that mean? So we are allowed, we have an invitation to read the Torah largely. And when we do, then we get to the sod, we get to the secret, we get to unveiled once we do the journey. And once we read, not on the first level, because sometimes the first level is painful to read, but there is always, and that's why it's, it's, a, it's important, A, to study together in a chavruta, and B, to study with other books, what Rashi says, what Rambam says, what other more contemporary people, not necessarily and only rabbis, but what are the offerings? How do we get to paradise? Paradise here, the pardes, the garden here, is by understanding this tremendous gift that we were given and that we said that we will do and we will listen. Interestingly enough, when we take out the Torahs from the Aran, the Torah that you take out is a Torah you have to read. And we fortunately have Freddie who knows how to have the Yad on the proper Sefer so that when it's taken out at the time that we take out the Torahs at the correct one, because otherwise there's a lot of rolling to do when you take out the wrong one because it has to be read from. So even there, even in the minutia, there are these 
ways and laws that guide us, constantly guide us, even in the way that the Torah is read on Shabbat. For people who don't know how to read, because of the trope, you can understand that there's drama sometimes when the letters are repeated in a certain vibration. Everyone is included. Everyone is made to feel part of what is offered to us. None of us are superior to anybody else because they know how to read or they know how to, or they understand. And there's a melody. And you can close your eyes and see the drama unfold and hear the drama unfold. It's another gift, which I think is such a beautiful gift. So let us... So when we, there's another way in which we are made aware of the presence and that we are in the presence, so we can imagine to be in the presence, is when we do the, the Baruch and we, and we bend, we say Baruch Ata Adonai. By the time you say Ata, you're up. So that when you say Adonai, you're straight. You're not still bent over because then it's idolatry. So you say Baruch, Ata, up, Adonai, up, you're up already. So that there's a certain reverence, there's a certain formation, and there's a certain habit that your body does eventually automatically, and that you have that reverence be part. It's not just that you do what you want. You do the bow correctly because there's an intention. You're standing. Imagine that you're going for a job. You're going into the room. You're going to meet the director. You, you have a certain attitude. There's a certain way in which you regard the position of that person. Well, it's the same thing that we are invited to have to learn reverence in silence and also in what we don't necessarily see. We have an understanding, but we don't see. Um, Rosa, should we take a look at, is there, should we go on or um, is there anything that you, that anyone wants to ask? And I haven't seen any questions from anyone, but is there, if you want to take a minute, if there are folks who have questions. Or we can continue on. You can let me know what to go, move on to. Okay. <clears throat> Another symbol of who we are and that understanding is the Magen David, which is 27, the image 27. If you look at the Magen David, and this one is a, is a very beautiful one, and it, the way it's worked into the wood, is that up? It's in the first first batch. Yes, Marisha? should be. Okay, I, I haven't seen any of the images, so I, I am going along with you. You have it? Yes. Okay. So the Magan David is made up of two triangles above is the triangle that has the point on the bottom and below is the point that is up on top. 
And those are to remind us again of our existence down here and that there's an existence up above. And we recently read in the Pirkei Avot that there's an eye that sees, there's an ear that hears, and everything is inscribed in the book. So that Hashem understands that it's not easy down here. It's, um, it's struggle, and especially these days, it's even more so. There's a, a tension, there's a, a space of worry, especially people who have children. We don't, we don't always know, but we're connected. And we're connected when we hold the tzitzit together, we bring the earth and the heavens together. We're not alone in understanding that we have a task and that, that that task has to do with our existence down here, but that we affect the way things are above us. And we see in other ways how we affect nature by thinking that we could do whatever we want. Kashrut comes in every day, has a role, and it's to teach us discipline. Certain things, as we mentioned earlier, are either once a year or once a month or once a week. The discipline, humbleness and humility is every day. And Kashrut tells us it's not because you can that you should. And we are set apart. If you sit at a table and everyone is having shrimp, well, your plate is empty. Unless, of course, you eat shrimp, but that's okay. <laughs> but the point is that, yes, we could eat shrimp at home. Let's say you keep kosher or you don't have tray food if you don't keep kosher. There's no policeman. There's no gendarme. If I have a ham sandwich today, I'm having the ham sandwich. There's no one else here. But the Torah tells us that you are set apart. It's as if Hashem put us in a Petri dish. And he said, I'm going to have an experiment. I'm going to do something with this small people. You're a small people as opposed to everybody else. You're rather small. At least we were at 600,000 at the time. And I'm going to try to see if this works. And I'm going to put restrictions on you things that you can do and things that you cannot do, things that you can eat and things that you cannot eat. And it's always amazing to me that 3,500 years ago, without microscopes, without laboratories, the Torah names, gives a name to these things that we are to stay away from. And interestingly enough, like the lobster and like some of the other crustacea, they are the garbage can of the, of the ocean. They clean the ocean. We need them, and there's a shortage of them now. And of course, the meat of the, of the lobster is very tasty, especially dipped in butter. So uh, it's made even to entice you, perhaps, it's a wink that we are, you see this good tasting thing? Well, not for you. And by doing this several times a day, because we eat two times a day or even once a day, we exercise restriction because it's so difficult. Temptation is always there. You wanna have something that you know it's not good for you. Forget that it's quote unquote forbidden, but something that isn't good for you that you, you want to have. Of course you can have it, but then you have ingested it. How you boil an egg. It goes back to that image. 
how you boil an egg, how you feed yourself. So it's not so much that we are told these things are things you can't eat or um, can't mix. So for example, milk and meat is boiling a calf and the mother's milk. There's an arrogance. It's translated into arrogance that you feel you can eat and do in life as you wish. That mother looking at that child being boiled in her milk, just imagine what that's like. The Torah also tells us to chase away the mother bird from the nest when you're taking the eggs so that she doesn't have the pain. And how do we know a bird has pain? Well, the Torah tells us that she has pain. It's an amazing document that we were given in terms of just behavior alone and how the world would be if we could be that example because what Hashem waits for from us is that we become a symbol. That together, when others look at us, they go, oh, that's what a Jew is supposed to be like. So we're given, not only given these instructions, but we're given help all along the way. We're given the grace, the chain, in which to confront very difficult times. And the Torah is, moves with us. There are things in there that we can understand what is going on today, which was, I mean, there have been other plagues. And we, of course, we don't, know how individually people reacted and what they did during those plagues. But we've had various classes uh, with Dini and, and understanding that there's the, the, the Torah, if there's certain ways of asking those questions that are, can be contemporary, that, that we can use the wisdom of 3,500 years ago today, there was no internet. There was none of, the, none of the tools and the toys that we have today. But the Torah instructs us and guides us and gives us symbols every day, every week, every month, every year. And when we look at them, we're immediately sent to the place where they belong. And we go there because we know we belong just inside, underneath that talit, underneath those tzitzit. That's where our shelter is. So I thought what we could do, unless there's uh, anything you want to go over, Any questions? So I thought now what we would do is to do the breakout room by couples. You may remember this, Nancy, when we did that and we each had uh, paired off and then wrote the intention, which I will give you. And then we took, at those days, we took the Polaroids of each other. And then you were each given the Polaroid of the other person that you affixed to that sheet of paper. So what I suggest we do, if we can, um, you can pair them off, uh, Larissa? Yes, happy to do that. So on the piece of paper, I'd like you to write I intend to abandon blank in order to make room for blank. I intend to abandon blank in order to make room for blank. And you fill in those two blanks. And then what I would like you to do, we'll do it a few minutes. 
you will read what we did when we did this in person, we each read the other's intention out loud. It's a little scary for the person whose text is being read, but it meant, at least it meant to me that we're, we're, we're shouldering one another. I'm taking your intention to heart. I'm l having you listen to your intention through my lips. And in six months, we'll check in with one another and see where your intention has gone. And then what I'd like you to do when you're in the room with your partner is each of you take your own selfie and send it to the other person. So that since we can't, I can't, I was thinking of how maybe to do a screenshot, but it's not going to work on Zoom. It's, uh, it's blocked. Um, you can do it on FaceTime, but you can't do it in Zoom. It's a, it, it just is a dark square. So you'll each have to take your own selfie, if you can, and then email it with the text to the other person. Okay, shall we try it? Sure. All right, so I'm gonna, I've assigned everybody to rooms. Um, if you have any questions, I believe you can um, use the chat box, um, but you can always come back to the main room. So I'm gonna send you all to your breakout rooms right now. So folks who are still here, you should have gotten an invitation and I, you have to accept the invitation um, to the breakout rooms. And let me know if you're having issues with that for any reason. Like some folks are here, but not quite here. Uh, I'm gonna move some folks around. Not quite sure. Let's see, Howard. The breakout room. One. 